So in this video, we're going to look at how do we calculate work in just a bunch of different applications and some more uh, sort of tricky situations. Um, so let's say you've got a person here, um, really long arms. Um, they're carrying a pile of books like this. There's their pile of books. And they're walking across the classroom. So they cover a displacement of 10 meters. So there's their delta D is 10 meters. Um, and they're holding these books up, right? So there'll be a force, an applied force they're exerting upwards on the books. Um, the books would also feel a force of gravity, by the way. If I draw a little fruit by a diagram in the books there, that would be the two forces they would feel. And that's just useful because that lets me quickly calculate the applied force. The applied force would cancel out the force of gravity, right? Those would be balanced um, because the books aren't accelerating up or down. Um, so that applied force I could calculate just by doing the mass of the books, 20 kilograms times 9.8 and I'd get 196 newtons. But when I go to calculate the work done by the applied force, I'm not gonna be multiplying the applied force by delta D, I'm multiplying the component of the applied force that's parallel to delta D times delta D here. So I'm looking specifically for how much of that applied force is pushing the books forward, and then I multiply that by that forwards displacement. But if you look at your applied force here, it's just holding the books up. That's all it's doing. No component of the applied force is in that um, delta D direction. There is no parallel component. So this value here is actually zero. And zero times 10 is of course zero. So this is feels a little bit counterintuitive, but the work that you do on the books to walk across the classroom is actually zero joules of work kind of feels confusing because you might feel tired after carrying the books across the classroom. So you might be like, I, I did work here. From the physics definition of work here, you actually didn't do any work. You didn't add any new energy to the system by holding the books up like that. All right, here's another situation. Let's say you have student A here. Student A is not very nice and they push on poor student B over here. So there's gonna be a force um, that's applied, we could call it A on B, so the force of A on B, and that is a 15 Newton force um, that student A gives student B. That causes student B to slide 40 centimeters. So the displacement of student B is going to be 40 centimeters. I'll convert that to SI units right away, right? So 0.4 meters. And we want to know the work done on student B by that force from student A. So that would be the work done of A on B, so the work done on student B by student A. So that's going to be that force uh, of student A on B, but just the parallel component times the displacement of student B himself or herself. What I can see here is that this force is completely horizontal, the delta D is completely horizontal, um, so those are in the same direction. So I'm going to have a positive work here and um, all of FAB is this parallel component, right? All of that force is parallel to delta D. So I get to put in the entire 15 newtons here, multiply by the 0.4, and 15 times 0.4 is 6. So this will be 6 joules of work. So student A is adding 6 joules of energy to student B when he gives him a push or her a push. All right, now let's look at student A, because we know from Newton's third law, right, that if student A here pushes on student B, then there's going to be a force that student A feels backwards here, right? This is the force of B on A. Student B here could be the nicest person in the world, but if student A pushes on him, by definition, he's going to be pushing back on student A. Student A will feel a force back from student B when he does that push. Um, and it will be the same size, right? It's an equal force in the opposite direction. That's Newton's third law. Let's see how much work that does. The, the interesting thing here, though, is that student A is actually standing still. So the displacement of student A is zero. So what you're looking for in the displacement um, part of your work equation is the displacement of the object that's feeling the work, that's experiencing the work. So if I try and calculate the work done by B on A, I would want to take that force B on A parallel and multiply the displacement, but even though that force will still be 15 newtons, the displacement is zero. And so the work done on student A by student B will be zero simply because the person didn't go anywhere. So this is another kind of 
um, counterintuitive thing, but say you push on a wall, you can apply as much force as you want to that wall. If the displacement is zero, you're not doing any actual work in the physics definition of work. So you're applying a force, you might be pushing really hard, you might feel really tired afterwards, but your delta D was zero, so the work that you did on the wall is zero. You didn't actually add any energy to the wall. That's the case here. Um, student A is feeling a force, for sure, but if they're not going anywhere, their delta D is zero, no energy was added to student A. All right, there's a little typo in this one, my apologies. Um, so um, it's not thrown straight up, but it's thrown up from uh, original height. Um, this volleyball is thrown from a height of 1.5 meters with a velocity of 20 meters per second and an angle of 30 degrees. So that would kind of look like this. So Y1 is 1.5 meters, and here's the ball. And this is 30 degrees in here. And the initial velocity V1 is 20. And the ball is going to kind of go up and come down and hit the ground, and the y2 will be zero. So in this case, the displacement is how far did the ball go from the start to, to the finish? So from the start to the finish, the ball went from here, oops, sorry, from here down to there. So that's your actual displacement. Um, the force that the ball feels is going to be straight down. So I'm looking for the work um, done by gravity. So the force of gravity that the ball feels is going to be straight down that whole time. Now this is actually a situation where it might be easier uh, to find the component of your displacement that's parallel to gravity um, and multiply that by the force of gravity. So if you remember when we introduced our work equation, work is in general a force dotted with a displacement. And you can either write that as being the component of your force that's parallel to delta D times all of delta D, that's what we usually do. Or you can say, well, it's your whole force times the component of delta D that's parallel to the force. And in this case, this is actually the easier form. Most of the time, it's easier to split your force up into components. But in this case, it's actually a lot easier to split delta D up into components. So let's do that instead. Um, so delta D will have a component in the y direction and in the x direction. And the part that's parallel to the force of gravity is definitely that, that y direction force there. So that's the part, that's your delta D parallel here. That's the piece that I'm really looking for. And delta D parallel is just how far down did the ball go? So it actually doesn't matter that the ball went up and then came down. I'm just looking from the start to the finish here. How far did the ball go in the vertical direction? And it went down, so negative. Uh, 1.5 meters, um, that's all it did there. The force of gravity, um, I can calculate fairly easily. That's going to be negative mg. Um, the m is uh, 2 kilograms and g is 9.8. So that force of gravity is going to be 2 times 9.8, which is uh, negative 19.6 newtons. And the work done will be that force of gravity, the whole force of gravity, so the negative 19.6, times the component of delta D that's parallel, which is the negative 1.5. And notice that we should get a positive work here. Um, so 29.4 joules, and then we're going to need to round this off to sig figs. It's actually only one sig fig here, so it'll be 3 times 10 to the 1. Uh, joules of work done. That's the work done by the force of gravity there. Um, but notice it's a positive work because your delta D is overall down here and the force is also overall down. So if your force is pulling you in the direction that you're trying to go, that your delta D is, that's a positive work. These are both negative numbers, right? A negative times a negative gives you a positive at the end of the day. The only time you get a negative work done is if your force is opposing the direction you're trying to go. So maybe you're trying to go up and your force is down, or you're trying to go down and your force is up. But here, the ball is moving down and the force is down, so that's a positive work. All right, what about if we have a student who's 60 kilograms um, and they're accelerating forward at 0.25 meters per second squared um, for a distance of 7 meters on a surface with a coefficient of friction between their shoes and the floor of 0.3. So here's the student. 
they feel an acceleration forward. If I do a little free body diagram of them, right, they would feel the force of gravity. They'd feel a normal force from the ground and they'll feel a friction force. Um, it's a static friction force on their feet. Um, that's what's causing them to accelerate forwards. Um, question is, do I need to calculate that static friction force using the point three here? Well, the thing is, I'm not told that this student is almost slipping. So the, the static friction force has this weird equation, right, where the static friction force at its maximum is equal to mu s times the normal force. Um, but you only get to use this equation at the moment where your feet are like just about to slip from underneath you. Like you're accelerating so fast that your feet are almost slipping. And there's nothing in this problem that says that, right? So that means that I can't use that equation at all. Basically, I have no nice equation for the static friction force. The only way to get it is by summing up your, uh, your forces in the x direction. The net force in the x direction, though, fortunately, is very straightforward. It is just the static friction force. That's the only one there. We also know that the net force in the x-direction is going to be the mass times the acceleration in the x-direction. And so that is actually the, the, the only way I can get that static friction force. So let's calculate what it is. The static friction force is going to be the mass. Um, the mass is 60 kilograms times the acceleration, 0.25. So that's um, static friction force must be 15 newtons here. Um, now, this student moves forward at delta D of 7 meters. We can draw that on my picture, too. So there's the delta D, 7 meters forward. Notice the static friction force is beautifully parallel to delta D. Um, so the work done by that static friction force is going to be that static friction force itself, the component that's parallel, but that's all of it. Uh, multiply by delta D, and so we get to just plug in our numbers. The 15 newtons there, the 7 meters there, and that gives me 105 joules. Um, I should probably round that off to sig figs. Um, so the work done by that static friction force is just going to be 1 times 10 to the 2 joules of, of energy. That's what your friction force is adding to the system. All right, our last example. Um, so we can know the mass of the Earth. We know the mass of the moon. If I draw that system, here's the Earth. Earth. And here's the moon. Sorry, it's hard to write small. Um, and the, the moon is orbiting around the Earth here, in a circle, sort of like that. Um, we know the distance between them. The distance they are apart is there. Um, we're trying to find out the work done by the Earth on the Moon when the Moon travels through an arc of about 10 degrees is bigger than 10 degrees, but I'll, I'll draw it on there. So that's like my delta D there. So this, this angle in here would be 10 degrees. So I'm looking at, um, well, what, what is the work done by the force of gravity on the Moon as I go through, as the Moon moves through that, that arc there? Sorry, I'm just going to clean up my picture a little bit there. Okay. Um, this one looks really complicated. It looks like there's all these numbers here. Like, should I be calculating an equation for the force of gravity? What's really helpful is to draw my free body diagram of the moon. The force of gravity looks like this, right? The force of gravity is going to be pulling straight towards the Earth. And what you should notice right away is that that force of gravity will always be perpendicular to your displacement at every moment in time. Like, even when the moon moves over here, right, the force of gravity is now this way, and your delta D is now this way. At any moment in time, those two are always 90 degrees. So when you go to calculate the work done by gravity here, you need to take the component of the force of gravity that's parallel to delta D and multiply by delta D, except for no component of the force of gravity is parallel to delta D, because at every moment in time, the force of gravity is 90 degrees to delta D always. And so the component that's parallel will be zero always. So it doesn't even matter what delta D is. There's an arc length formula we could use to get it, but we don't need to because we're going to do zero times that delta D. So the work done by gravity is zero. So that's a good thing, actually. So that means that the Earth is pulling on, on the moon, but it's not adding energy to the moon or taking energy away from the moon. 
Um, if, if as the Earth was pulling on the moon, it was taking energy away, if I got a negative work here, then the moon would slowly spiral in and hit Earth, right? And if, if the work done by gravity on the moon was adding energy, if I got a positive work here, then the moon would sort of spiral out and eventually we'd lose our moon and that would be kind of sad too. So it's a good thing that the work done by gravity on the moon is actually zero.